I could ever do that by myself. <laughs> so, real quick, I know we're running out of time. We got started a little late, but as she said, I went to Bun here, and uh, my mom and dad are the pastors, Pastor Joe Ferguson and Rana at the New Hope Worship Center right up here off 39. So I was raised in church my whole life, and then I found out my dad was going to be a pastor. Oh, great. Even more church. <laughs> so I was just like you at one point. Some of you, you should probably get bored with it. It's the same thing over and over. You go, you sing a few songs, clap your hands, talk to your buddy, sleep during the message, and then go home. And then he'd call me out in the middle of church sometimes. I didn't like that. Anyway, so, you know... One, one point I wanted to point out, I heard a speaker last Friday, and he, I'm not going to go into his message, but the whole point of what he said was Satan doesn't appear before you and reveal his entire plan to destroy your life. He slips it in there piece by piece. Because if I was Satan, can I have a volunteer, please? You, come here. <laughs> so she's sitting here, you know, hanging out with her friends. Boom, I'm Satan. And I've got my pitchfork and my horns and my tail. And I'm going to destroy your life. What I'm going to do first is I'm going to get you to rebel against your parents and make them look like the bad guys. They don't know what they're talking about. And you know it all, okay? So then what we're going to do is we're going to get you hanging out with the wrong friends. And then after you hang out with the wrong friends, then we're going to get you doing things you never thought you'd do, like drink. You might get hooked up with the wrong guy. And you're going to end up pregnant. And then what's going to happen is you're going to hate your life so much that you're going to start cutting yourself. And then I might even put, hook you on some other drugs, you know, maybe start you with marijuana, get you to cocaine, and then maybe some meth. And then before long, you're going to want to die. And then you're going to commit suicide. How's that sound? Right, you'd probably take off running, right? Exactly, thank you. Have a seat. So, it'd be nice if that's what he did. But that's not what he does, and that's not what he did to me. He slips it in piece by piece. First thing comes to first. I started skateboarding. I like to skateboard a lot. And uh, my dad tried to tell me I was going places I shouldn't be skateboarding. That's rebellious. Stop, you're rebelling. Dad, you don't know what you're talking about. I know it all. I know how to do this. It's fine. It's fine. Well, I get arrested and I get thrown in jail. Who has to come bail me out? Mom and dad. Okay, he was right about that one. Anyway, so there had been put this thing in front of me and my parents. that They were dumb. I knew it all. So life goes on. I'm about a senior in high school. I started getting into music. I was uh, very athletic, but I started going away with that. I wasn't really into the baseball and stuff anymore. I still did it, but I wanted to play music. So I started a Christian band that didn't really go Christian for too long. And then I decided to join another rock band. And I started smoking cigarettes when I was about 17 years old, and that led to trying other things. Uh, started, I tried marijuana a few times. I didn't like that one, so I passed that one by. So I got mad at Mom and Dad. I'm moving out. I'm going to Raleigh. I'm doing my own thing. I don't need your help anymore. So they said, okay, you know, what are we going to do? We can't chain you to the house, so go. So I go, and I go to Raleigh. I joined this rock band. I lived there for a little while. And then I, uh, the band starts gaining popularity, gaining popularity, and we start touring. We start going from place to place to place, and then I found alcohol a, a, a way of life. It was every, something I did absolutely every single day of my life. If I didn't have alcohol in a particular day, I got a headache. I couldn't think straight, and I felt like I couldn't operate without it. And there was party, party, party every single night. There were days that I didn't have any money. I had about $5 a day to live off of for about a year and a half. And with that, I bought cigarettes. And, you know, there ain't much left after that. But um, if I could get me some sort of alcohol out of that, that's what I did. So it was, I'd rather do that than eat. That's how bad it was. So then from there, popularity picks up, picks up, picks up. We start getting a little more money. So I'm getting checks rolling in left and right. So I decided I'd be a, a, a baller, as they call it. And uh, I started trying other things, going to parties, people saying, hey, man, try this. Hey, man, try that. Well, what does it matter? I'm out on the road. I'm drunk every night anyway. What's, why not? So I found myself addicted to cocaine. I said I'd never do cocaine. I lived in Bun. I thought cocaine was something you only saw on TV. <laughs> not, I promise. It's all around here. 
And uh, so I found myself hooked on cocaine, and one night there was a particular party, and I had been drinking. I was all, had ran out of cocaine, so somebody started crushing up pills, and we were snorting these, and, and then I smoked pot, and then before I know it, I, I didn't wake up for days at a time. And nobody that was at that party called the cops, nobody called the ambulance, nobody called anybody, and I laid there on the floor for days. I should have been dead. It was nothing but a miracle from the Lord that I'm standing here in front of you today to be able to tell you about this. So then life goes on. That wasn't the end of it. I kept that a huge secret because my band could not know what I had been doing that night. They just thought I was really drunk. I had been hiding all this stuff from them. And I was going on and on and on. And it got so bad, I made, I got a $6,000 check when we were recording. We were recording for three months. By the end of that three months, every single bit of that money was gone. Cocaine, alcohol, every single bit of it. Finished Warp Tour 2007, got a $7,000 check. A month and a half later, gone. Drugs, and that's $12,000, $13,000 right there. That makes me want to throw up. So, but then something happened. When we were in New York and, uh, and I found myself miserable. God, I don't want to live this way anymore. God, please don't turn your back on me. Don't forsake me. If you can still hear my voice, if you can still hear my prayers, I'm starting to see that mom and dad was right. I'm starting to see that they did know a little bit about what they were talking about. And so I just started praying, God, I was always around people, constantly surrounded by people, played for thousands of people all the time, but I was lonely. I was still missing something. I had all the money. They, they provided us with all the alcohol we could want. They provided us with whatever. There were girls, everything, whatever you wanted, the rock star lifestyle. It was all laid out in front of me, but still I was absolutely miserable and I hated my life. I didn't want to do it anymore. So I prayed when I asked like, God, if you can even still hear me, if you would even show me enough grace to hear this prayer, please don't leave me. Please don't leave me. I promise I'll stop soon. I want to stop as soon as I can. Please don't leave me. So the next morning we pull up in New York, and not New York City, it was upstate New York. So there's a gas station, and across from it, there's this field, and this uh, minister gets out. And there's a guy in a field just reading a Bible over a microphone. The speakers weren't this big, but he had a little thing out there, and he's just reading his Bible, and he stops and points in my direction, and this is a good ways away to where I couldn't see his face, he couldn't see mine. And he just points right in my direction. He said, whoever you are over there, the Lord told me to tell you, he will never leave you, and he will never forsake you. And I just started bawling, and I ran into the trailer of our van because I didn't want my bandmates to see me crying. And I was, thank you, God, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so glad you heard me. True story. So eventually the Lord started tugging on my heart, started tugging on my heart, and finally he showed I stopped drinking, I stopped smoking, and all my bandmates were saying, what's going on with him? So finally they got the point, and I told them I was going to quit in two months, and they are like, no, we're, you're quitting now. We're dropping you off tomorrow in Florida because that's where we were about to be. So I ended up being in Florida for a few months, but anyway, change, like I told our church on Sunday, change is not an event. Change is a process. Amen. You know, everybody wants change right now, and miracles happen right now, but to be transformed to something completely new, it takes a little bit of time, and the Lord has to pull things out. You know, he broke some addictions in my life then, but there's still things now that he's like, Adam, I don't think so. You got to work on this. You got to work on this. I'm still not perfect, and I never will be. But because of his grace, I am here. And I want to tell you that it does not matter what you've done. I've probably done it, and maybe twice. And the Lord, his grace, and his blood covers us. And, he, and, and if you don't want to believe that the Lord died for you, or if you don't want to believe you think that you did something so bad that he cannot forgive you, then he died for nothing. Because it says that he died for the sins of the world. That means sins I already committed and sins that I'm going to commit. That doesn't mean go around and do whatever you want to do. Put it right here. But that tells me that he has grace for me and he loves me. And he loves each and every one of you the same exact way. There is nothing that you've done that he cannot forgive. And there is nothing too big for him because he created this entire world. And he created you with a plan 
and a purpose. If he didn't have a purpose for my life, then he would have let me die on that floor back then. But he had something bigger for me to do. So that's why I'm here. This is what I'm doing. I thank you, Coach Hal, for asking me to come back out again this year. And um, it, it's truly been an honor to be able to come and talk to you guys. And uh, I really appreciate you hearing me out. Thank you. said he was a student here at Bun, just like y'all. He ran track for me, and uh, let me tell you, Adam was fast. He could run. Yeah. And uh, Adam, we're proud of you, buddy. Amen. Yeah. Okay, we're going to, uh, like uh, Abby's going to come up and introduce our next speaker, like and then you. we're going to change it around a little bit, and then we'll have a, uh, where is uh, Brett?